There we, there we go. All right, so we're doing a tr uh, Translations Act 2, Scene 1 overview. And let's, get on, let's make this work. Beautiful. So as a starting point, I want you to think of Act 2, Scene 1, something of the, of the intellectual heart of the play. Right? The key ideas can all be found in Act 2, Scene 1. They're elsewhere in the play, sure. But, the, um, but Act 2, Scene 1, you can find everything right there and you can answer almost any essay question by focusing on that. The thing I note uh, here is the end of Act 1, you have that line from uh, Owen where he says, it's the same me, isn't it? To which, um, to which Manus replies, oh yeah, there, uh, it, it is the same you, kind of sarcastically. But I wonder if, I wonder if that line it has an extra layer of meaning, that it's not simply about Owen at all. It's about the whole process that's happening. Are the places the same when the names are changed? So it's not no coincidence that you have Owen having his name changed to Roland through some process of misunderstanding. Is he the same Owen when he's Roland? Is Ballybeg still, uh, is, ba is Bailey Byug still Bailey Byug when it becomes Ballybeg? Because Bailey Byug is a fictional town. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't exist in Donegal. There are towns in Ireland, about six or seven, called Ballybeg. Um, and Bally, Bally Byug, if I get the pronunciation correct, literally translates to little town or small town. So that's, it's an interesting choice there for Friel to choose that as his name. This is a little town, it's a small town, it's representative, but it's also a bit of a mosquito in the whole, in the whole project of colonisation. This isn't a major town. But it becomes gibberish, transliteration, Bally Beg. Remembering that transliteration is, uh, is uh, the difference between translation. Translation is taking the meaning of the word and translating it into the English version. Transliteration is taking the sound, taking sound. Bally Byug cannot be written in English. That sound can't be created. So it just becomes something close enough. Bally Beg. Bonnahawan. We have Yolan's quote, uh, quote here. What he says, there's no English equivalent for a sound like that. The word sound is critical. It's not that there's no, no English equivalent for the, the literal meaning. They actually end up with one. Um, I'm trying to remember what it was. Um, but they end up with, uh, with one because it describes a place uh, like an estuary, a river mouth, right? And so, but there's no equivalent to the sound. How do you write? How, you can't transliterate. Bunnahawan and so many other words. And so this question comes back. Is it still the same Donegal? Is it still the same island when these places are renamed? The landscape is all the same, the people the same. Does the act of changing the name change the essence of the place? And that's a question in this. That's why this play is nuanced as opposed to being simplistic. And we talked about that yesterday. It gives a nuanced view of, every, uh, of it. It doesn't give us clear answers, although we might indeed come up with our own answers. In Act 2, Scene 1, we see this idea of tribes emerging really clearly. And in, in Act 3, that becomes even louder. So we have this, uh, this statement here from, from Yolan. Even if I did speak Irish, I'd always be an outsider here, wouldn't I? I may learn the password, but the language of the tribe will, tribe will always elude me, won't it? The private call will always be hermetic, won't it? This word hermetic means kind of sealed, kept away from me. The word hermit, if you know, someone who's kept away and out there. He will always be an outsider. He may learn the password, but the language of the tribe will always elude him. So this idea of tribe comes in. In Act 3, we have, um, uh, uh, we have Jimmy Jack talking to Moira, talking about exogamine and endogamine, the marrying inside the tribe and outside the tribe. And in Act 3, this echoes later on when we have Jimmy Jack, we, we've, from the very start, he's talked about Helen of Troy and all these mythical women. And he completely loses, it, uh, loses grip on reality in Act 3 and talks to, um, to Hugh about, oh, I'm going to marry uh, Helen. Will Zeus, uh, Athena, I think, uh, but will Zeus uh, consent? And the point here is that uh, Greek, in Greek mythology, tribes um, intermarrying never works. And when gods, when, uh, when gods and mortals come together, it always ends in disaster. One cannot marry outside the tribe. 
and this will also have an echo again with the, uh, in the very first uh, moments of Act 2, Scene 2. Uh, the first thing we have is Moira um, and Yolan jumping across a ditch together. And, and she says, oh, it, it, the, the ditch nearly killed me. That's a very deliberate thing from Frill, the ditch being a boundary. And we're going to come up with this a, a couple more times. So tribes and language are really important. We learned yesterday that language isn't simply about a, um, a way to give unity and, and help people to understand each other. It's an exclusive thing. We use language to exclude and to identify who does not belong, to identify the other. To extend on this, we have Yolan saying, I mean, I feel so cut off from the people here. And I was trying to explain a few minutes ago how remarkable a community this is to meet people like yourself and Jimmy Jack who actually converse in Greek and Latin. And your place names. What was the one we came across this morning? Termon, from Terminus, the god of boundaries. It, it's really astonishing. There's an irony here of all the place names to bring up at that point. It's the one that's Terminus, boundaries. Boundaries are being clearly defined throughout this, this idea of boundaries, tribal boundaries, language boundaries. What's the other word that we heard come up? Contour. To be trapped in a linguistic contour, a linguistic boundary. The irony here that the place name is derived from boundaries, crossing linguistic and tribal boundaries is central to this play. And then we have identity. Even if I did speak Irish, I'd always be an outsider here, wouldn't I? I may learn the password, but the language of the tribal always elude me. I've got this twice, I don't know why. But it's the same quote again about connecting language and identity and who we are. And this links back, remember, to the it's the same me, isn't it? Are, are the people the same? Are the places the same when they're being renamed? But we can't forget that this is a play. It is a mistake to get lost in the ideas because you need to be able to integrate your understanding, the ideas and the use of dramatic elements. Dramatic tension is always going to be one of the big ones, yeah, but, but it's also a, a mistake just to only get lost in that as well. But Yolan's love for Ireland is being sown here as a character motivation. This will manifest itself through his love for Moira, or Mara. So early on, he's talking about his love of Ireland, the love of the sound of the place. He's entertaining the thought of moving there. Could I, could I be here? And at the end, and the scene ends with uh, he and Mara trying to talk to each other. And the clues are, are set strongly that, that they're going to fall in love. Yolan brings up the Donnelly twins in this, sowing the seed for the uh, violent, uh, violent tensions that will arise bringing chaos, forgive my typos there. Um, that's a very deliberate ploy from Friel. The Donnelly twins just sit at the fringes of this play, always threatening. In Act 1 we find that they're, they're kind of mischievous, they've stolen some horses and stuff like that. But we have Yolan here, you know, a middle of the road military man who just, who's heard this name, this echo of the Donnelly twins and they threaten to bring chaos. And so that is a structural element. It's building that dramatic tension, reminding the audience that the Donnelly twins are out there in the fringes, they're going to bring the chaos, and inevitably they do. Although we never, um, it's never literally given to us that they're the ones who kill Yoland, we can re reasonably infer that that's the case. Owen's own motivations come into focus. He will need to decide who he is. Is he Owen? Is he Roland? Because this whole argument about Toba Vri and that, that comes up isn't even about the place. This is Owen. Who am I? Am I going to move forward with this colonization? Am I going to be part of this and become Roland? Or am I going to resist and be Owen? What are the implications of that? If I resist, not just the physical ones, am I going to be trapped in this linguistic contour that Hugh warns us about? And so a tension that comes up that's worth noting, and that's, you won't see the words written on here, is this tension between tradition and modernity. All right? So you have this tension with, uh, with Hugh, Jimmy Jack, and all that. the tradition of keeping the place names that are there, and modernity. 
Modernity is this process that we talk about that emerges out of the Enlightenment period, this ideology of empiricism. Modernity is about, uh, isn't about being new or modern in a sense. It's about being organised. It's about standardising everything, having a rule of law, uh, rules of commerce, all those sorts of things. This period, 1833, modernity is really just starting to, uh, to, to really gain a foothold in our ideology. And there's a tension between that. When you saw the, um, when you saw the uh, what was it called, Shadow King the other night, the Aboriginal interpretation of King Lear, the adaptation of King Lear to talk about the tension between tradition and modernity in Indigenous culture in, in the Northwest. Do, um, we have the Lear character being torn in a sense between going, uh, uh, staying with his traditional roots and the young Edmund who wants to kind of take it all and almost sell out to mining interests. That tension between tradition and modernity that's there. We have dramatic tension with Mammoth and Yolan. The interesting part about this is the father issues. They've both got daddy issues, these boys. Manus is trapped in Ballybeg and Ballybeg by his loyalty to his father. He is literally and figuratively lame. Right? He has a limp, but he's, he's, uh, he's literally limp, but he's figuratively stuck there, like he's symbolically stuck, uh, stuck in Ballybeg. Yolan, on the other hand, has been driven there because of his own tension with his father, living up to the expectations of his father. And Yolanda is also trying to please the father figure, Lancey. Lancey is something of, uh, of a surrogate father. Both of these men have that parallel with each other. And so it's then interesting if we look at them as the two options for Mara. She wants to get out of uh, Bailey Bio. Yolanda promises so much more. He's also more of a romantic than Manus. Manus is a lot, is a, is a lot more pragmatic. We need to, uh, to think about drama and the ideas here. Hugh, the phrase goes, and I'm uh, interrupting work, uh, work of moment. He goes to the door and stops there. To return briefly to that other matter, Lieutenant, I understand your sense of exclusion of being cut off from a life here, and I trust you will find access to us with my son's help. But remember that words are signals, counters. They are not immortal. And it can happen, to use an image you'll understand, it can happen that a civilization can be imprisoned in a linguistic contour which no longer matches the landscape of fact. Note the pause there. So the essence of the idea is drawn directly from Steiner, but Friel uses his exit. Hugh exits the scene, he leaves the stage. That becomes a punctuation of the idea. Just to return to that, he leaves. The leaving at that point is critical. You can't leave Hugh on the stage at that point. His leaving punctuates the idea and signposts to the audience that this is central. This idea of being trapped in a linguistic contour. A civilization can be imprisoned in a linguistic contour. Keep in mind, this is where context and genre collide. Because this play is being presented in 1981 to an audience in Ireland talking about their history with the conceit that Hugh uh, and these characters are speaking Gaelic. But they're not actually speaking Gaelic to the audience because the audience really doesn't understand it. The island was still trying to transition, uh, trying to reclaim, I guess, it, its, um, its cultural roots. So this speaks volumes to the audience in 1981. And the same ideas can, can then keep translating further. In fact, the video we watched the other day of uh, Stephen Fry, where he talks about language, he warns against that. Then we talk about the, the pedants out there who want to hold people to these um, rigid ideas of what words should mean and how language should work. It's that same idea, that if we only think about our language through these rigid rules and you're only correct if you use them this way, we will be trapped, uh, trapped in linguistic contour that no longer matches the landscape of fact. Exits and entrances are the key to Friel's craft. I've written next week there, because early next week I've got a, a presentation that really focuses on how entrances and exits are there to punctuate ideas and to signpost the key ideas. Christings. 
Throughout, uh, throughout the text, christenings appear in various forms. We see it in Act 1 because we have Hugh off at a christening. Can anyone uh, remember the name of the baby or the mother of the baby? Break. No, they knew the mother they knew. She, she knew she was pregnant. Well, they didn't know the, father. <laughs> the father. So her name was Nellie Rude. Remember Nellie Rude's baby? And there's all this speculation about what the baby's name would be because the name would tell them who the father was. But here, um, just after this, we have Owen Eden's right. We name a thing and bang, it leaps into existence. Each name a perfect equation with its roots. So we talk about this project that we see in Act 2, Scene 1 of renaming. It becomes godlike. It becomes Genesis. And the implication is that Ireland did not exist until it was given a name. And there's a quote from yesterday that was the premise of yesterday's lesson from Wittgenstein. The limits of my language are the limits of my world. So the implication here that, that ties into this kind of loosely, but the implication is that colonization works in this premise that the civilization in, in a place doesn't exist until we bring it. The identity of this place does not exist until we name it. Um, yeah, so, um, and this idea of christening keeps reappearing throughout the play. And Top of Re becomes, I guess, the central thesis or the central argument in this scene for this. The discussion of Top of Re follows immediately from Hugh's exit. So to go back, the, um, Friel has just said that they can be trapped in a linguistic contour that no longer matches the landscape of fact. And when immediately into this discourse about Top of Re, which is about a well that's not even near the crossroads, name, that's actually a corruption of Brian or Brian, a guy that nobody's ever heard of, nobody even knows the story. So this location, Top of Re, is that example of a place that is trapped in a linguistic contour that no longer matches the landscape of fact. A dry well, not even close to the crossroads, named after a person nobody is um, nobody even cares about. And that's where that juxtaposition of ideas, the putting them side by side becomes important. And that's where you have dramatic elements, entrances and exits coinciding with ideas. Is it right to call that location Top of Re? That's kind of the question we're being asked. Should it still be called Top of Re when it makes no logical sense to do so? Because culture is not logical. And that's the point of this. They're, they're trying to standardise and anglicise to bring cold, empirical logic to the landscape. And Yolland, and perhaps Friel, but the question being asked by us is, do we agree with Owen, that we need to give logic to the world around us, or do we agree uh, with Yolland, that no, we should pay homage to the romance of it all. The sound of it is beautiful, it, even though it makes no sense. Let's just stay with it. Naming and ideology come back. We have that quote again. I've put it back here. That this is an example of Top of Re. When they, if they read it, it comes into existence. Each name a perfect equation with its roots. The end of the scene brings the naturalistic style of the play to the fore. We have the tripping over. Now, the critical part here is that Manus has just come back and he said, I've got a job in Inishman got this job and he's just said to Moira, he's, he said to Moira, how would you like to live on an island? Remembering in Act 1, where she's indicated that she would marry him, but she won't because he's got no prospects. Now he has prospe prospects. He's arrived in Act 2, Scene 1, where he is marriageable. Everything's working. He's got this job. He's no longer a slave to his father. In other words, slave's a bit strong, but he's no longer in the service of his father. And in, in line with Friel's craft, he exits at that point. He goes upstairs and we're left with, Ma with Mara, Owen and Yoland on stage. And you have this backwards and forwards and tripping over of language between them. The sorry, sorry, what, what? And basically it ends with them agreeing that uh, Yoland can come to the party the following night. But it's very clear that, that Mara is interested in Yoland at that point. And then Manus comes back. He enters again. And he says, I'll walk you up to the house. Is your mother at home? I want to talk to her. Why would he want to talk to her mother? 
He wants to say, I want, yeah, I want to take Mara to Inishman. I want to marry your daughter. How about it? He's just kind of indicated. He hasn't said it, though. And that's where he's also figuratively, in a sense, lame. That the, the, cripple, uh, it, it, the crippling of his leg, the disability in his leg, isn't just not being able to walk well. It's that he can't go that next step even here to say, let's get married. He didn't even say it there. He, he alludes to it. He's always that one step short. And we have Mara saying, what's the rush? And then turning to Owen, didn't you offer me a drink? Now that's, not the, that's a few lines before the end of the scene. But there we have a significant tipping point where we have ideas and performance coming together. Because you've got the structure of the scene, but here you have Mara saying, what's the rush? Which is ironic in the sense of it's in tension with what she said in Act 1. She's been in a rush to get out of Ireland and go to America. She's, of all the characters, in a rush to learn English. She is the most rushing character in the place. And now she's saying, hey, settle down. Stop. I'm, I'm, I want to talk to Owen. And then she turns to Owen. Didn't you offer me a drink? So he's basically indicated I want to, uh, that he wants to get married. She's essentially said no right there. There is a source, a, a tipping point, a key moment in the development of the dramatic tension of the play. And it is critical. So Act 2, Scene 1. In any essay you write on this, you will talk about Act 2, Scene 1 and the transition to Act 2, Scene 2. All right, so in the, um, in the stage directions at the start of the play, Friel um, says that this is a three-act play, Act 2 is split into two scenes, and there's an intermission here. Friel has insisted that the audience gets up, goes out, has a drink and a cigarette, well, well I shouldn't say that, but anyway, <laughs> goes out, has some peanuts in the, uh, in the intermission to come back and see the second half. No peanuts? Okay, so have some, something containing no nuts. No nicotine, nothing. Okay, there we go. So, concluding thoughts. This, is, uh, this scene is really important. You've got, if you want to take anything out of this scene, the intellectual centre of the play in terms of the ideas. Stein, um, Friel set out to write a play about language. But it is also a play, and it has to do things that plays do. Develop dramatic tension, wrap a narrative around that to engage the audience. So you have these, uh, the, the language and ideas, uh, the confusions of language, all coming together with the use of dramatic elements in the context of 1981, all colliding together. And if you can really grasp that it's a collision between those three, that they're not separate elements, they're all integrated together, you'll write a really strong essay. And I'll just end this now, and then you can ask some questions.